Okay, everybody, if uh, I could invite you uh, back to your seats, please. Uh, there are seats up front here as well, if uh, students are looking for some. Our next presentation will be by Professor Gretchen Daly, and uh, her respondent will be uh, Bill Sundstrom, a professor of economics here at Santa Clara University and a member of the organizing committee for this conference. Professor Daly will be introduced by Michelle Marvier, associate dean in the Santa Clara University College of Arts and Sciences and professor in the Department of Environmental Studies and Sciences here at SCU. Michelle. Thanks. Gretchen Daly has said that she realized she wanted to become a scientist when, as a teenager growing up in West Germany, she saw the destructive effects of acid rain on forests. She is now the Bing Professor of Environmental Science, Senior Fellow at the Woods Institute for the Environment, and Director of the Center for Conservation Biology, all at Stanford University. She is also at the forefront of a groundbreaking global movement in what is called natural capital, or a way of putting an economic value on preserving ecosystems like the forests of her teenaged West Germany. Usually, economics puts a value on nature in terms of what can be extracted from it or what can be built on it. But Professor Daly has argued that we need to put values on the remarkable benefits that intact ecosystems provide. Her work has drawn global attention and earned her many of the most prized international environmental honors. It is easy to find ideas about natural capital in the text of Laudato Si. Indeed, last year, Professor Daly spoke on the topic of man mainstreaming the values of nature for people into decision making at a Vatican meeting of the Pontifical Academy of the Sciences and the Pontifical Academy of the Social Sciences. Her book, co-authored with Catherine Ellison, called The New Economy of Nature, The Quest to Make Conservation Profitable, has garnered widespread attention. She has been elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and received the Midori Prize for her work in biodiversity. Professor Daly co-founded the Natural Capital Project to advance the practical goal of measuring the benefits of ecosystems. She has worked extensively with landowners, economists, business people, and governments. She has worked on projects related to natural capital in Africa, Asia, Latin America, North America, and Oceania. I think you only missed Antarctica. Um, recent scientific studies have found that human-caused factors like climate change are propelling a substantial decline in the health of global ecosystems. In light of such challenges, we are deeply grateful to her for joining us today to speak on the topic, securing the well-being of people and nature, a reflection on La Dadasi. Professor Daly. Thank you, Michelle, for that really nice introduction. I get so much of my inspiration from her. It's a, a real honor to, to be here. and. Um, I'm really grateful, actually, for this invitation. I had intended to read every word of the encyclical, and now I've done so kind of backwards and forwards and really um, have enjoyed meditating sort of on the many messages in there. And, yeah, one of my problems today is that um, I don't know if you heard Professor Ramanathan say this morning that he spent several days just trying to trim back his talk. Um, I've been working on mine really hard, and I have a 12-hour talk for you. I'm, I thank you for hanging in here in advance. <laughs> um, so we'll get going. What I'd love to do is um, focus mostly on seeds of hope. So I was grateful that Professor Ramanathan kind of went through some of the obituaries, as he put it, this morning. And certainly those are out there, and those are what drives all of us in this um, arena, is just kind of the knowledge of what's going on. But um, there's a lot of new stuff going on that's really amazing um, that hasn't gotten much press yet and um, that constitutes, I think, kind of the lights um, <clears throat> and beacons to which we can aspire to move in our own communities to drive change. So I feel we can see a lot of um, different types of communities activating based on, you know, their 
their values and on their awareness of what's going on. And these communities are out in the world all over the place, so I'll, I'll take a more global view and um, we'll go beyond cities. Cities are absolutely crucial in all the ways that the mayor so convincingly um, laid out and is laying out in all his work. But obviously, if we put a dome over San Jose or any other city, it would be like being up on Mars, that movie, The Martian, which I highly recommend. Um, but, you know, we wouldn't last very long. So we'll expand our view again and, and then look at communities operating in, in all sorts of places, including in governments, in corporations, in NGOs, activating and driving change. So that's the plan, and we'll reflect on Laudato Si as we go. Um, and I'll try to trim back a little bit. <laughs> um, so what we have here, as an ecologist, my economist colleague was saying, you know, we're so lucky we get to throw up these beautiful slides. So this one is um, of a tea plantation in Uganda. And I love it because it um, illustrates what I'd love us to focus on, and that is um, the values that we might attach to the people and all the other life forms in the slide. So we know a lot, if we look in the foreground at the tea plantation itself, we know a lot about, we can at least imagine what it might be like to be a worker in the plantation, cultivating the tea, tending all those plants, picking the leaves, drying them. We know what it might be like to be part of the corporations that package up and market and distribute that tea all over the planet, including to Santa Clara University. And we can imagine what it might be like to be part of a government um, sort of regulating at some level <clears throat> what goes on in tea plantations. But then look at that whole ecosystem in the background. What do we know about that cloud forest? Cloud forests provide us with a tremendous amount of water. They s help stabilize the climate. They're um, kind of the library, the genetic library of all known life in the universe from which we've derived all kinds of clues as to how to live a better, more fulfilling, healthier life. There are incredible benefits that come from that cloud forest and yet we don't capture them anywhere. We don't really think about them. We don't factor them into our decisions. And so cloud forests are disappearing all over the planet. That's, I'll have a couple tiny obituaries as we go. But um, what can we do about that? That's what I'd like to talk about mainly as we, as we reflect on what the Pope has said. Um, and I'll give a few of his own reflections as we go along here. You know, nobody's suggesting a return to the Stone Age, but we do need to slow down and look at reality in a different way to appropriate the positive and sustainable progress that's been made but also to recover the values and the great goals swept away by our unrestrained delusions of grandeur. So our goal, and from here we'll dive into the change that's happening, <clears throat> but is to become painfully aware, to dare to turn what's happening to the world into our own personal suffering, and then, and thus, to discover what each of us can do about it. So I'd really like to focus on what each of us can do about it, knowing that everybody here is busy doing things. So I'd like to start um, with this uh, nerdy little diagram, but just to emphasize that, um, maybe I'll see if I can walk. Um, <clears throat> just to emphasize, can anybody see that red dot that I'm waving around up on the screen, or is it too small? Okay, I'll just stay up here then. Um, <clears throat> so what we'd like to be able to do is see alternatives to what we're doing today. That's in that top circle in gold. And connect what we're doing today and the choices we make, our decisions, to ecosystems, to our life support systems and the many services that we get from them that supply our human well-being. And then connect up through institutions such as, you know, the city government of San Jose and many other institutions to drive change and make better decisions and reach for better alternatives. Um, and here, this was kind of the most, I don't know, one of the lines I really liked. Um, All it takes is one person to restore hope. And so I'm gonna be going through stories with you, often led by you know, 
a great group of people, but with one person, you know, kind of believing and um, believing in the impossible and trying to make it happen. So the first story has to do with just <clears throat> developing more knowledge. And this goes back to what Professor Ramanathan was emphasizing this morning too, that you know, universities um, have a huge role to play and then people seeking knowledge and co-developing that knowledge with others to understand how our choices link to ecosystems and to the many benefits we get. Because, you know, all creatures must be cherished with love and respect for all of us are dependent on one another. We're not disconnected from the rest of creatures, but joined in a splendid universal communion. And as an ecologist, I have the lucky um, <laughs> job of being able to describe how that is. So just to go over briefly, you know, if you were San Jose under a dome, what would you need that you couldn't get from within the bounds of the city? And what do we need to be thinking about to sustain cities like San Jose or Santa Clara or wherever? So obviously we get a huge array of goods. We're pretty familiar with these. We can get them in the supermarket and stuff, but um, from all sorts of ecosystems around the world, tropical reefs, this coffee plantation in the bottom left, the wonderful koa wood grown in Hawaii, shown in the furniture on the right. Um, and then these are two of my favorite ranching friends from Hawaii in the middle. But then we get all sorts of other things. If you were to think of going up to the moon, or even into the future, if you think of how much we're changing planet Earth, um, what species would you bring with you? You know, what bits of nature? Would you bring a coral reef on your spaceship on a one-way trip to the moon to have a happy life up there? What would you actually need? Let's assume you're not gonna die the minute you, you know, get off the spaceship. Um, there's a decent atmosphere and some soil even though we know that life you know, played a huge role in creating the oxygen in the atmosphere and the fertility in the soils we have on Earth. But you'd have to think through all of these types of services like climate stability or water supply or down to pollination. Most of our crops are pollinated by little bees that we never give a thought to, including coffee. Um, it's pollinated by bees. So which would you put in your back pocket and take up to the moon? How would you decide? That's some of the science that um, Michelle has been at the forefront of. It's been really cool. And related intimately to that is thinking about, well, what would make life on the moon worthwhile? What would make it fulfilling in the deepest, most human sense that we all need so desperately to live a good life? Um, and then finally, you can just to make the economists happy, um, but it's also just to be humble and think about how little we really know about what we need and about these intimate connections we share with all these other creatures. Um, we need to think about protecting our options a little bit. We're driving such rapid change here. Um, humanity has become by far the biggest force on the planet, you know, and until an asteroid the next one hits this planet, it's going to be people, much more than any other force that determine, you know, what survives. So how, we're, we're sort of um, making those decisions, whether we think about them consciously or not. So what, what would we bring up to the moon or into the future? Um, so here's the last, I think, bad news in the 12-hour um, talk. It's, um, the, just this observation that each year sees the disappearance of thousands of plant and animal species which we'll never know, which our children will never see. The great majority become extinct for reasons related to human activity. And we have no such right. Um, <clears throat> so going on, and with that backdrop, I, to give a bit of a personal story as um, Professor Ramanathan did, I was extremely lucky to happened to um, get to work in Costa Rica starting around the year 1991. And it was right after a time when Costa Rica was leading the world in terms of extinctions and tropical deforestation. It had the highest deforestation rate on the planet. Um, and yet Costa Rica has turned around. They now have the highest reforestation rate 
um, they, together with, you won't believe this, and we'll get to this country later, China. But how did Costa Rica do that? They um, had a bunch of people that came out of universities in the Bay Area, some hydrologists and others who recognized what was happening and what a tragedy it was, and how flooding would become much worse, and indeed seemed to be becoming worse, um, with stripping away forests. Forests are like sponges that soak up heavy rain that, that naturally comes to tropical parts of the world. Um, and they thought, okay, the way to secure this country economically and in lots of other ways is to invest in forests. And they actually established a policy, the first one, the first nationwide policy to pay people to replant or conserve forest on their land. And the other amazing thing, speaking of equity and engagement and inclusiveness, they kind of fought the World Bank who was helping to fund this. And, and this, this is contentious um, from an economic point of view, but I appreciate what they did. That rather than just paying the people who had maybe the most important forest as far as protecting people from flooding goes or securing drinking water quality, stuff like that, they said, we're going to pay anybody. You just come here and sign up. And um, that's because we want everybody to be part of this social movement. It's about a lot more than just storing carbon or um, purifying water or securing our communities from flooding. It's about the whole change in our values. And, and that's the way they've driven the program. It was immediately heavily oversubscribed and has basically remained so. Um, and then right here in the US, there was another really inspiring case that opened up. How many people know about New York City? I'm just curious. Um, <clears throat> so it, I'll give just a brief account. It's basically that the city, which is shown in the bottom um, right down here, there are about 9 million people there you know, drinking water, living and working every day. And then that green blob 100 miles to the north is where most of that water, 90%, comes from. It's really beautiful New England. I bet today is an especially beautiful day there um, area. So all these people in the 80s had built these modest little uh, weekend homes that you can see on the right, right along stream sides up in the Catskills, Delaware watershed, that, that beautiful green part of the map. And that led to a real decline in water quality and a lot of worries you know, over diseases like Giardia or Cryptosporidium and a worry that um, while the city was famous for having really pure water coming straight out of that ecosystem, that now they'd have to build a very expensive um, filtration plant. That was expected to cost six to eight billion dollars. And that price tag was just so high to make the story short. It sort of gave everybody pause and gave an opening you know, to consider a different approach. So instead, a bunch of people proposed, why don't we go out and um, pay way less? It ended up costing about one and a half billion dollars instead of six to eight to secure some of these um, vital services of, of the forest land and the agricultural land to purify water and secure that water for the city re residents. And at the same time, sort of have a win-win where people up in that rural landscape are getting paid to steward their land in a better way. So that guy on top, David Hawley, he got that tent to serve as, as a, it's a type of technology, a much better barn than the dank, dark barns where calves and cows would get really sick in the winter in his dairy operation. Um, and the city paid for that. And the city bought up land like that little marshland on the right um, and revegetated it to help trap nutrients and um, pathogens. And then they went around in the bottom slide, you know, fencing areas um, to keep cattle, that one of the big sources of potential disease risk, out of the water. And you can say, well, that's all so obvious. It is. It isn't really rocket science there, but getting the win-wins together, that was the rocket science. And there's actually a third win, right? The first is that people down in the city, maybe they're getting their clean water at the lowest cost. But then people up in the Catskills, they're actually getting paid for the first time for benefits that they've provided to the city throughout its history. And what's the third win? What other benefit is there? 
the ecosystem. Yeah, would you rather spend a romantic weekend away in a water filtration plant, you know, or up in this beautiful area hiking and eating and drinking? Um, so these cases that came up in the 80s and early 90s were really transformational, and they have inspired. It's interesting to see how um, change has unfolded, triggered from times back then. Back to the encyclical. Interdependence obliges us to think of one world with a common plan, essential for confronting the deeper problems which cannot be resolved by unilateral actions. So how do we come together in our tightly interlinked world and address some of these challenges? How do we develop a common plan, a common vision? So these two cases helped inspire. They made people realize that um, protecting nature actually might be the, the path to economic prosperity and sustainability, and not a cost, you know, not at some trade-off associated with development. And we've gone way further, and I can, we meaning the global community. Let's just look at another really tricky problem. <clears throat> this one I'm gonna illustrate in Costa Rica again. So we're looking out at a coffee plantation with a bit of tropical forest on the left. And you know that everywhere you see coffee growing, there used to be tropical forest, as coffee is a tropical forest plant. So how would we, you know, in a way you could say coffee's been the enemy of tropical forest. How could we possibly harmonize, you know, coffee production and the livelihood, the farmers, the people, and rainforest? Um, so here's where students come to play, okay? There are a lot of students working on these projects, probably 20 or 30 in the couple that I'll show you here, went out and first of all looked at um, the different types of wildlife living out in that landscape. Guess how many bees are out there? How many different types of bee do you think we caught in one month? I thought it might be something like 30 to 50, you know, in a month. Um, that's what a friend of mine caught up in the Central Valley on some organic farms. So I thought it'd be a little higher than that, but not too daunting. We caught 700 different types in a project led by Taylor Ricketts, some of you might know, um, in a very short, in that one month. And um, how many birds do you think are out there? It turns out there's about 200 common birds, you know, flying around out there, including that crazy one in the middle, the scale-crested pygmy tyrant. And then how many bats? <laughs> Gotta go out at night for those. And this one on the right, it looks a little bit scary, but it's smiling. Um, <laughs> there are about 70 different bats. They're, they're much harder to sample. I think there are a lot more, but, <clears throat> but we've gotten about 70 out there, just in that little landscape. And what are they all doing out there? And, <clears throat> and is there any win-win with people? That's the bottom line, <laughs> given where we are in the world today. So yeah, the bees after a ton of hard work, we found out that they actually boost yield by 20%, and they boost quality of coffee beans by about 50%. So having rainforest right near your coffee farm is actually a blessing, an economic blessing, in that um, these farmers are often on the edge financially, and this boost is really significant. And the bees aren't going to fly, you know, 100 miles to go pollinate some coffee bush, right? They're going to pollinate right nearby. We found out that the birds are reducing infestation of the main pest, the coffee berry borer, for which there's no chemical pesticide, um, not really any alternative, by 50%. What do you think we found for the bats? A complicated story. So there's more work to be done. Sign up for next summer. Um, they do a whole mix of crazy things. So the bottom line here is just that this little story illustrates actually what have been thousands of studies now led by many thousands of students all over the world trying to shine a light on the connections between our own lives here and the coffee we're drinking, for example, or tea, and what's going on around the world so that we're becoming aware and and becoming able to act. But how do we act? You know, how do we go from studies actually to policy and government governance? Um, I'm gonna to touch on one other thing. I don't wanna go on too long. Maybe I'm gonna pass over this one quickly. 
but it's, here's another topic that's just coming up that's massive, urban mental health. Um, a New York state of mind. It was reported in The Economist a few years ago. Urban brains behave differently from rural ones. And what people are noticing, just to cut to the chase, is that first of all, city living is associated with a big uptick, 20% in anxiety disorders and 40% in mood disorders like depression. And um, people have been wondering, you know, could this be partly because of an absence of connection with nature? Both, you know, with people having such, pr I'm happy to have the lights off, um, pressured lives. There's so little time to get out into nature, and then a lot of people just don't have access. So just don't go to sleep on me. But anyway, you know, referencing the encyclical, even says in there, you know, the references the feeling of asphyxiation brought on by densely populated residential areas. There's so many people who have so little time in nature. And one wonderful student has been leading a study just up the road. If you've been on the Stanford campus, you know, these people get tested when they arrive in the, in the building shown behind that bus. And then they go out for a walk and the, the lucky randomly assigned half gets to walk in nature and the other half walks on Il Camino. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> so, and they all get paid the same amount. <laughs> um, so anyway, they do tests, then they walk, then they go test again. That's the design. And just real quickly, we have them uh, take these sort of cognitive function tests where they have to answer whether a little math, you know, an equation is correct or not. And at the same time, they've got to remember these letters. And this stuff is flashing at them kind of quickly on a computer screen, so it's a little bit stressful, and I haven't taken that test yet. And then um, they also do stuff on just self-reported well-being, like how much are they ruminating, thinking like, my attention is often focused on aspects of myself I wish I'd just stop thinking about, you know, where you're playing over in your mind all the dumb things you've done in your life. Um, and then some of the lucky people get to go into this brain scanner before and after also, before and after the walk and the tests. And amazingly, well, first we confirm that they actually take the walk, so we give them cameras and pretend this is sort of a photography exercise, so they all take pictures, <laughs> and then um, incredibly, I thought this PhD student was going to be, you know, on the 100-year program, but he's gotten really striking results just after like a 45-minute walk or an hour and a half walk, a great improvement in working memory and in mood among the people that get to walk in the natural area, no change for those, at least we're not harming the people by sending them on El Camino, they're sort of unchanged. <laughs> they came from El Camino and they're just going back to it. And the nature walking people experience a reduction in anxiety and in rumination, which are closely related. They're sort of risk factors for depression. So I just wanted to bring this in as well. It's an area of science where there hasn't been as much work. I said hundreds of studies. But here too, there's a ton of interest into you know, bringing this into action through policy and governance. So how do we bring things into action? How do we develop as individuals and societies <clears throat> um, with this knowledge? Authentic human development has a moral character. So in the examples I'm gonna give you now, there's a lot of moral character. Um, I'm gonna skip over, the second story was gonna be, I'll, I'll just say very briefly, on developing some tools to help decision makers. It's hard to act just with the level of knowledge we've kind of gone over now. Well, how much rainforest should be protected or restored and where? And um, who should pay for it? And you know, who will benefit? Or um, where in, in cities, how do we create greater access? And how much, you know, what's the dose response function, so to speak, between nature experience and our cognitive and emotional well-being, you know, we need some tools. And in a big effort um, involving Michelle and a lot of hundreds of people, we've created tools that allow users to relate the conditions and processes and ecosystems to these sort of human well-being out outcomes that we'd like to see, fresh, plenty of fresh water, good livelihoods, food and happiness, and so on. We try to translate these into, you know, morally laden um, value metrics. 
um, <clears throat> getting to you know, drinking water quality, obviously, but also jobs and livelihoods and equity. Number of poor families protected from flood risk or sea level rise, access to sacred places, you know, honoring people who've lived there a long time and hold them sacred, and so on. Um, so last slide, we have a bunch of tools online. If you're a student and you want to work on any of this, um, just look up the Natural Capital Project. And then what I'd like to jump into now is the activation part. You know, how do we go from understanding, you know, our connections to nature, our dependence on nature, to actually changing what we do? And here's where Costa Rica and New York and some other early cases have... Um, triggered a, a really um, hopeful, I think, set of changes that needs to go a lot further, but here we go. A true ecological approach always becomes a social approach so as to hear both the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor. So all of these efforts um, involve um, both in the way described here and they span a wide range of countries. I'm gonna focus on three cases just to give you a sense. We'll start with Hawaii where we actually kind of started as a group. Um, then we'll go to Latin America broadly and then to China. So in Hawaii, I'm gonna give you just a thumbnail sketch. So apologies to people who know the story more fully. But um, basically, you know, when Captain Cook got there in the late 1700s, um, massive change ensued um, with Europeans moving in, some North Americans, and 90% of the native Hawaiian population actually was, was died at that time, and it didn't even look like native Hawaiians would survive as a, as a culture and a people. And the, the last princess in the Kamehameha line, Princess Powahi Bishop, she inherited a lot of land. She outlived her relatives, basically. So she got all their land shown in the dark blue across the islands. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with Hawaii. And um, you know these are stunning lands. And Kamehameha Schools, if you, you might not know, it's actually the biggest trust in the United States and um, is the biggest private landowner in Hawaii. And she decided, amazingly, she, you know, to leave as her legacy a, a schooling system to help native people survive globalization that was happening way back then. And um, she was married to an educator from the West. And what they did, so this trust got set up, there were a bunch of trustees, um, very, very few of them were ever native Hawaiian. And they said, okay, we're gonna maximize revenue for the schools to maximize the number of native Hawaiians that we can educate which is still only about 10% of the total Native Hawaiian population. And so they created places like this. And who fought them most? Who objected to this form of development most? It was Native Hawaiians saying, you know, what's in here for us? We've lost everything in this beautiful, this is Waikiki. We've lost everything. Now we can go in and clean tourist rooms. Um, and that's it. And so, going to the encyclical, you know, whatever is fragile, like the environment, is defenseless before the interests of a deified market, which become the only rule. So indeed, if we're thinking incredibly narrowly, as the Pope is saying we are in so many places, you know, just about maximizing uh, return in a, in a very narrowly defined way, that this is what can happen. And um, in 2000, the objections became so, um, strong and a few other things happened that the whole um, board of the trust got sacked and that opened opportunity. Several Na Native Hawaiians got onto the board and proposed an alternative approach. Balancing you know, economic value is obviously crucial. Economics, in many ways, it's about how you allocate scarce resources toward your goals. We, we have to be thinking about that. We have to be smart from an economics point of view. Plus, they're still being regulated by lawyers in LA and Chicago and stuff. But they're trying to fold in these other values shown here, environmental, cultural, educational, community value. We could think about this example for anywhere around here. Um, 
how did they do it? This is the land we worked on first. It's um, the north shore of Oahu, 10,000 acres. Last land in Hawaii with really productive agriculture. And anybody know how many days food supply Hawaii has at any moment of fresh food? People argue over whether it's like five or seven days. <laughs> Not a very fun argument. <laughs> very little. And um, from an energy point of view, same thing. Mostly they import oil. So huge energy security, food security issues, a lot of equity issues among the Hawaiian community and all the others. So how should that landscape, here shown in kind of a Google map with the land cover in these different colors, but how should it be managed to balance these goals? Um, after, or in the course of kind of a two-year process of making democracy come to life, of community engagement led by Kamehameha Schools. A team of students from around here um, used these tools I was referencing, and we actually co-developed them with um, Kamehameha Schools in this whole um, work together, and looked at, okay, well, the community thought, after looking at maybe 20 different options, there were three that really stood out as attractive. One was to shift Hawaii onto a much more sustainable energy economy. And um, to grow sugarcane, which they're really well suited to have a lot of experience in. Another was to um, expand residential development to deal with some of the really severe housing inequities in Hawaii. And um, get people sort of back on the land through this sort of lower intensity development. And then a third was to get people even more out on the land working in a diversified sort of agriculture and forestry system. And I'm going through this just to say, you know, think of what we would do if we actually planned this way here. What options would come up? How would we think about stewarding the sources of our own well-being, our bi biophysical well-being at least? Um, so through the tools, you could see that the best option across these, you know, vertically these three options and then looking at that time, we only had kind of three ecosystem models going for climate stability, the carbon storage one, water quality, and water yield, how much water are you getting? And they all had positive income returns, but the one on the bottom, the diversified agriculture and forestry, although it had the smallest income return, it had the highest value in other, in other um, dimensions. So we went out, we also worked a lot with a social science team, and I'm just summarizing in two slides here what they found, that I don't know if you can read, but interviewing um, people of different backgrounds, and here two Hawaiian men first saying, you know, my identity and the ecosystem, they're kind of one and the same. For me anyway, the ecosystem is what has made my identity. It's what has made me who I am. And, um, the other one saying, Hawaiians without land you know, cannot be Hawaiians. And meanwhile, interviewing recent arrivals from the mainland, here's a white man. I don't really feel you know, that identity is necessarily tied too much to places. So profoundly different views of these alternative scenarios of land development also you know, based on people's sense of identity. So bringing that in, um, the trust chose this plan that um, mainly emphasizes diversified agriculture, forestry, and then they found ways to bring in wind energy, not the sugarcane as a biofuels feedstock. But I went through all this just to say they then won the national level US award from the American Planning Association um, for the best thought through and demonstrated and now implemented plan. Um, so this case shows also the interweaving of kind of the social and the biophysical aspects of our well-being and the environment. And the question is, you know, can we replicate and scale anything like this? Can we learn from these cases like in Costa Rica, in Hawaii, in um, New York? And that's what I'll touch on now, just giving you two more cases. The first um, in Latin America and from the encyclical, access to safe Drinkable water is a basic and universal human right. Across Latin America, water security in cities has become an incredibly um, 
bright focus and also kind of grim focus with what happened in Sao Paulo recently. But just to summarize now, and without going into the detail, um, but hopefully to inspire, there's a huge effort led mainly by the Nature Conservancy using all these tools to link the upstream people in faraway watersheds, often much more than the 100 miles away in the New York case, up in the Andes, to link what they're doing <clears throat> to um, kind of investors down in the city that include all the different water users, might be hydropower companies, people living and drinking water in the city, corporations, agricultural cooperatives, and so on. And um, they're targeting these investments into reforesting or just managing the land better, like in that New York case. And the tools allow for that, this a standardized approach, so that now there's more than 40 cities all across Latin America, and these are the big ones, the big capital cities. And six of them, in fact, got going in Colombia, where there's been um, you know, a civil war going on for a long time. And these peace and justice groups are a big part of figuring out where and how to invest in community development, shifting livelihoods, and opening more sustainable livelihoods in the uplands and the Andean regions um, that at the same time benefit downstream people who are kind of paying for it, who want the clean water and the more reliable flow of water. We're now testing this in Africa, and um, you'll see there are a bunch of circles in the US even, so it's getting going here as well, though a, a slower start. Um, <clears throat> the encyclical also calls for you know, a legal framework which can set clear boundaries and ensure the protection of ecosystems, that this has become indispensable. And the amazing thing is my example for this legal framework, setting clear boundaries, is gonna be China. And um, we get so much bad news on China here, you might be a little bit disbelieving, but <clears throat> um, the Chinese government, the president and the premier, a couple years ago announced China's dream as becoming the ecological civilization of the 21st century. And what you see in China today is like a massive battle going on internally um, with the development of the past, you know, proceeding apace, but also with this new set of forces appearing, driving toward a much more sustainable um, <clears throat> outcome, set of outcomes, harmonizing people and nature. And all these leaders are asking you know, where and what should we protect? And they've gone out and set these clear boundaries. So using the tools I mentioned earlier, I'm gonna, well, I'm gonna say one thing, okay. After Costa Rica, <clears throat> China had these massive floods, and that's partly what motivated this. Massive floods, the worst flooding we've ever seen on the planet in 1998. And the areas in green and in light green are all getting payments through a deal similar to the New York or the Costa Rica um, deals, payments to have people shift out of growing you know, annual crops like rice and corn on really steep slopes, which is the source of a lot of the flooding and the risk, and instead grow you know, forest or in some cases grassland. 120 million households enrolled, that's the main message. I mean, where can you do that? That happened overnight, within about a year. 120 million households are getting paid to make that shift. So that's why China has the highest rate of reforestation worldwide. And now what they have, this started in around 2007, and over the years it's grown. If you just look at the map and you take in wherever you see a color, that region is being protected with kind of sustainable pathways of development, of poverty alleviation, human development, and securing ecosystems as the number one you know, set of goals. So for water supply, for sand and dust storm control, for, for biodiversity is weighted equally, and for flood mitigation. And there, there's a whole list of others. Those are sort of the national priorities. So it's the only country that's gone this far, identifying what its most vital sort of natural capital assets are and channeling investment in them. So there are now about 200 million people making their living in sustainable livelihoods, right now funded mainly through Beijing and other kind of regional 
payments. So <clears throat> I don't know how sustainable that will be, but this is part of the transformation, is just to see what's possible and try to shift the economic structure in all these rural regions. And with this comes you know, a remark, the common good calls for social peace, stability, and security, which cannot be achieved without distributive justice. And you might be questioning too, you know, how well is China doing on that front? And that's, you see the full spectrum, but among the, the many people working in this, in this force, uh, behind this force, there's so much attention, more than I've seen anywhere else, to people's livelihoods and understanding, like with this lady, how she makes her day, how she makes breakfast, where she gets her water, who she supports in her household, how far she goes across the land around her in order to get you know, the material ingredients of well-being so that these policies can be structured in a way so to avoid you know, many of the unintended ripple effects that were coming up over the lunchtime. There, there are tons of problems with all this, but it's incredibly inspiring to see what people are trying to do. And to go one step further in China, and then I'll close, um, the state government also approved a year ago about um, going beyond GDP. So GDP alone, they're saying, you know, that guided our growth in the last century. For this century, we're going to have, yeah, GDP, we'll pay attention to that. We're also going to have gross ecosystem product looking at all the goods and services that come from ecosystems at every scale and judging and promoting or getting rid of um, political leaders based on their GEP performance, not only on GDP growth, which is the standard today. <clears throat> this is another big thing. I don't know how it'll play out, but already many counties and cities have signed up to be part of this, and um, <clears throat> they've set up a massive system of accounts to, to calculate and track this. We have nothing like that here. They're monitoring, they've got over 200,000 little sites across China where they're monitoring ecosystem condition and the goods and flow of services from ecosystems. So <clears throat> ecological culture, just to bring things to an end here, there needs to be a distinctive way of looking at things, a way of thinking, policies, an educational program, a lifestyle and a spirituality which together generate resistance to the assault. How well are we doing? You know, how in reflecting over these cases and the many other cases I'm sure you know, how well are we doing? Um, I'm hopeful and I'm gonna give you two other maybe surprising examples to say why just briefly. The Dow Chemical Company working with the Nature Conservancy has recently announced that by 2020 all R&D capital and real estate projects will be screened to measure their impact on ecosystems and their services. And that by 2025, they're trying to get very specific in their goals, Dow will deliver $1 billion in value through projects good for business and good for ecosystems. And you can be skeptical about, you know, just the PR engine behind this. But there's also a lot of accounting going on that never used to go on, and attention to these connections. A light has been shined into a crack in Dow Chemical from whom we all buy products. Um, here's another, my last example. I just got to know the Norwegian government pension fund. They're, they're famous. They're the biggest pension fund on the planet. They invest in nine, over 9,000 companies, and they're valued at about $900 billion. How they invest makes a difference. A lot of other investors pay attention to what they do. And in 2014, so you see how new a lot of this stuff is, the, this Council on Ethics was established. Um, and its, its um, mission or you know, job is to screen companies for their impacts on climate, tropical forests, fisheries, and biodiversity. They also, I haven't listed it all here, but there are a lot of human rights dimensions and corruption and other things. But um, they're starting to develop new tools also to do this screening. If we could change how we invest, how we all have our little bank accounts or our other types of investments, where is that money sitting and what are we promoting in where we put our money? If we could change that, we could really drive big improvements. So 
getting back to this reflection, there's obviously a long way to go on the one hand, but on the other hand, I think a lot about this friend I've made recently who is in this investment sector and helping to drive this. He grew up in the UK and his dad was really into sailing and would make him, even as a young boy, get onto this small boat and sail across to North America. And he said he was always terrified as they left the United Kingdom and lost sight of land and they're out in the middle of the Atlantic, days on end, you know, being hurled by waves. And, um, and then a time would come when they could smell land. They couldn't see land, but they could smell it. And he'd finally feel e at ease in the boat at that point. And he's saying at this moment, you know, we can't quite see, sorry, I get so emotional, um, you know, what land will look like, where we're gonna hit exactly, but he's hopeful. And, and many people in this movement, and there, there are a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of people in this movement around the world, and I've just kind of highlighted a few cases, feel that we're approaching what the Pope is calling for, a common set of goals and a, a morality to what we're pursuing so that we can, we can smell the land now and things, there, I feel there is a good shot of things coming together if we activate if we actually all become involved in this one way or the other, at least educating ourselves, bringing others in, driving change here or in other ways um, as we can in our lives. I feel Silicon Valley, you know, we can lead the world. It's our responsibility and it can be our joy to do that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Daly. Um, Professor Bill Sundstrom of our economics department at Santa Clara will offer a response. Well, I'll, I'll leave this up. This is such a great slide. I'll uh, leave that up for a couple seconds uh, before I get to my one and only slide. Um, it's just a real pleasure, especially after that super inspiring talk, to, to comment on Professor Daly's uh, important remarks and, and welcome her to Santa Clara University. It's uh, fantastic. Uh, I guess presumably after having seen this, maybe you're not wondering why they put an economist up here to respond to this, but I do want to offer sort of a few economists type perspectives. Uh, I think Professor Daly to me is just an inspiring sort of example of, of, of somebody who does you know, truly interdisciplinary uh, work and um, drawing upon all sorts of concerns from a variety of disciplines and, and, and teams of scholars. and. Um, I've only recently discovered how, how challenging, but also how exciting that can be, and it's, it's certainly very important for this particular set of really crucial issues. Um, I, I, I wasn't gonna say anything about my own personal background on this, but I, I, I couldn't help but uh, respond to the, the, the question of whether I'd rather spend a vacation in a, in a beautiful Catskills resort or in a water filtration plant. And uh, I have to say that my uh, love of nature and hiking in the outdoors was largely inculcated by my father, who's a chemical engineer who works on wastewater treatment. And on more than one occasion, I was brought uh, for entertainment purposes to, uh, to some activated sludge plants and uh, other uh, fine things like that. So um, it may, maybe I might be the one person who would answer that <laughs> differently. Whoops. There's my one slide. Uh, I don't know if anyone knows who that, what that is, but uh, just it was in the news. Uh, this is a NASA photo of the recently uh, rediscovered Ushtagaisky Square in Kazakhstan, which is a huge Neolithic earthworks of uh, kind of unknown uh, origin and, and uncertain purpose. And uh, you can see the, the size of the thing, the scale is it's just one of these dramatic things that can only be seen uh, uh, from space in its entirety. Uh, I also have to note it looks a little bit like supply and demand curve, which uh, is, is, a, is maybe, maybe the appeal of it to me. Um, I think it really serves to me as kind of a, 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 a kind of an obvious symbol uh, and reminder of the, the really large-scale imprint that, that humans have had on Earth for, for now for thousands of years. But the encyclical Laudato Si really sounds the alarm that this this human imprint uh, is now 
on a truly global scale and has obviously accelerated and grown to the point that, uh, that our natural systems that support life and human thriving on Earth, uh, our common home, are, are really under serious threat. I think the encyclical does an excellent job describing the severity of that threat and asserting the, this moral imperative to act, especially given the disparate impact of climate change on, on the world's most vulnerable peoples. Um, the irony of our predicament, I think, is, was, is not lost on, on Pope Francis, and it was really highlighted by Cardinal Turkson last, uh, yesterday in his address. Uh, modern economic growth has really lifted a, a large portion of the Earth's population out of what I think of as kind of a, a Malthusian uh, past uh, to, uh, of poverty, to which a large majority of people have been relegated over the many, many generations. Um, and this really has only happened in the last couple of centuries uh, on any systematic basis. But obviously modern economic growth uh, uh, was fueled by burning stuff, uh, in particular coal and oil, and, and vast and destructive alterations to our natural landscapes. And now, of course, we're suffering the, uh, the accelerating cumulative ill effects of those processes uh, and need to respond uh, quickly. Uh, the Pope suggests that the problems we face can be solved with radical changes in perspective and lifestyle. That's really the, the only way to go about it. Uh, he may be right about that, and I think uh, Laudato Si is, is an important step in moving that transformation forward. Uh, but like many economists, I, I, I kind of uh, view myself as a little bit more in the Liccardo camp as kind of a realist and a pragmatist. And uh, the realist in me really assumes that uh, there are a lot of people who will continue to wish to join uh, rather than reject the ranks of consumerist culture and that profit seeking, uh, AKA greed, will continue to be a driving force in modern capitalist economies and, and I would include communist China uh, in that list. Uh, as a pragmatist, I think you know, our best hopes uh, lie in creating policies that steer to the extent possible self-interest and technological innovation and consumerism toward a more sustainable path. So uh, great if we can change hearts and minds, uh, but we can also alter incentives. So here I find myself really enthusiastic about uh, what I see as kind of Professor Daly's pragmatic but really profoundly hopeful uh, vision in her work for a long time. Uh, she's been a leading scholar and proponent of the idea of valuing ecosystem services and natural capital and of using those valuations broadly conceived as an integral input to the decision-making process in both public and, uh, and private life. An important strength of this work, I think, which comes across so clearly in, in the presentation is the emphasis on the relevance to decision making at a scale of actual human institutions and communities. So putting it to work. Uh, I've seen calculations of the value of ecosystem services and natural capital globally. Maybe you have too. They're in the many, many trillions of dollars. And I think that has some kind of uh, useful propaganda purposes to remind us the, of how uh, much we're, we depend on our planet. Uh, but they, these kinds of calculations can't really play the kind of uh, policy making role that, uh, that these uh, comparisons say of the value of regional watershed services uh, do. So uh, think globally act and calculate uh, locally is, I guess, kind of the, the message there. Um, I, th I hope, uh, you know, I, I think of the, the, the natural, valuing natural capital and ecosystem services, even in dollars, comes very naturally to me as, a, as an economist. We're probably the only people who, you know, find it uh, completely comfortable to talk about the selling the right to pollute and uh, what's the dollar value of a human life. Uh, but I would like to say a little bit about the role of valuation in decision making uh, from the economist's point of view and, and as it relates to the, to the talk. Um, I think of valuation, that exercise as, as an input to decision making that does not really require accepting some kind of reductionism that would distill all the competing and plural values that we hold down to some individual cash nexus. But I do think it acknowledges uh, the fact that human decisions really do involve a lot of trade-offs between competing uses of resources and allocations of goods. And that in our world, uh, as we have to take it as it is, uh, some reckoning of those costs and benefits is really an important step in assessing the trade-off. So really, I think it's uh, some of the power here uh, to me is, is find, you know, actually discerning what are those uh, costs and benefits and taking a much, much broader 
uh, and uh, flexible view of what those are. I think the alternative to thinking about valuing eco ecosystem services and natural capital typically is not going to be some kind of thoughtful dialogue, although I have to say I was inspired by some of these examples. Uh, but uh, typically what's happened in the past is that the value of nature is simply uh, ignored or downplayed uh, to a level that it doesn't deserve. Uh, ecosystems are, sister services are, as uh, Cardinal Turkson suggested, a common resource. Common resources don't usually have a particular stakeholder who uh, owns them and obtains market value from them. Or in some cases it does have such owners or stakeholders, but they're people who are, uh, have marginal political power or economic power to, to exercise. Um, I think this points to another virtue of thinking about these sorts of uh, values uh, and valuations is that it offers an opportunity to bring a, a wider variety of stakeholders to the table. So even the people who are the stewards of those natural, uh, the natural capital and ecosystem services, the, the, the indigenous peoples, the farmers, the fishers, folks who live upstream essentially uh, and use those uh, resources uh, now have a, a place at the table because they're, the value of what they provide to the downstream users is recognized. Uh, I would add that valuation is really a crucial policy instrument in many other areas of environmental policy. Um, so for example, setting a price on carbon emissions, whether that's through a carbon tax or some sort of cap and trade uh, program. Um, I'm still debating how I read those passages in, in the encyclical, but I'm, um, I'm giving a, a generous reading here. Um, we can, through those kinds of mechanisms, at least assure that uh, polluters pay uh, for the damages that they cause and therefore start to align incentives uh, for conservation and alternative energy development. Um, I would add, in the spirit of Laudato Si, is that we uh, must, as we think about those kinds of policies and, and valuing and taxing and cap and trading, we always have to bear in mind the issues of distributive justice that are so central to the message of the encyclical. Uh, so for example, pricing carbon uh, in a way that as an economist I think would be appropriate is going to raise the price of gas at the pump. And if low income people spend a higher percentage of their income on gasoline, uh, we have a distributive impact there. And, and uh, we always have to bear in mind uh, uh, mitigating or at least considering those sorts of policies, uh, impacts. Uh, Professor Daly and her colleagues, I think, call upon us to think about our common home in, in some ways, much the way that a, a homeowner would think about the house that, they, that she or he lives in, uh, as a source of essential services, including shelter, but also an infrastructure uh, for a variety of life-supporting and life-enhancing activities. And uh, like a, a private home, uh, our common home is of, of course, tremendous value to us, but it's also something that will depreciate in the absence of proper upkeep. And I would add, uh, in, and this relates to, to work that I believe she's been involved in as well, this provides, I think, a suitable economic definition of sustainability that can be built on this foundation. Uh, namely, that a sustainable economy is one uh, in which the net impact of human activity leaves the next generation with a stock of capital, including physical, human, but also quite importantly, natural capital, sufficient to maintain at least the standard of living of pre the previous generation. An unsustainable economy, then, is one that is, whatever its current state of expansion of production, productive capacity, is one that is so rapidly running down its stock of natural capital that it threatens to the continuing well-being of future generations. And an economy that, that, is, that is permitting our common home to fall into serious disrepair, uh, as the encyclical puts it uh, quite directly. Um, so I think this approach is sometimes might be accused of being anthropocentric. Certainly, I think economists uh, in the mainstream are, are anthropocentric, and uh, we're talking about the value of nature for, for humans. Uh, but uh, we, this, this approach takes, allows us to take a, a very diverse and uh, all-encompassing view of the variety of, of human ends uh, that we place values on, both aesthetic, spiritual, uh, justice concerns, etc. So there's no need to leave aside uh, all of those important things. I'd like to finish by uh, applauding one additional aspect of, of the approach Professor Daly has taken in, in much of her work. Um, 
as our livelihoods uh, here in Silicon Valley and elsewhere have moved away from the land for the most part, and our everyday lives have become increasingly urbanized, it's very easy to overlook the extent and depth of our continuing dependence on ecosystem services. And that, that question of what, what critters would you take with you to the moon, I think, is a great way to think about that. This is not just our food that comes from these services, but uh, the actual clean air and water that we consume. And of course, uh, all on our minds entirely today is uh, a livable climate. Uh, valuing ecosystem services and natural capital brings those critical life support systems back into view, even for, for us city or suburban folks. And, and I have to say that one of the most interesting sections uh, that, that I found in, in, in reading the encyclical has to do with life in the city. And this also relates to this, this question about uh, whether El Camino Real is bad for you or not. Um, I, I live not too far from it, so I can, I can say uh, maybe so. Uh, it seems to me that urbanization really is, is, is an, a super important topic. Um, it presents you know, great challenges, but also I think great opportunities for solving our crises of the environment and social justice. On the one hand, rapid urbanization does have the potential to isolate us from each other as well as from our experience of the natural world, and that comes out, I think, very clearly in the Pope's words. How can we expect solidarity with nature from someone who has spent their entire life in uh, crowded apartments in Mumbai or Mexico City or, or Chicago? Uh, and, and that gets us back to the mood disorders. Uh, but on the other hand, urbanization really does remain one of the most promising avenues we have for reducing our carbon and land use footprints and for nurturing a rich, diverse, and tolerant, i.e. cosmopolitan, human community. Um, in this respect, I, I am with uh, two earlier speakers as well that uh, I think building livable, energy efficient cities, ones that have maybe some uh, sufficient open space to keep us all sane, uh, is really one of the most important investments we can make uh, in both social and natural capital uh, at this point in our history. And it certainly, I think, is a, a, a recurring theme of the day. So with those uh, economists' reflections, I will uh, let you off the hook, and I am so grateful to, to Gretchen Daly for her uh, wonderful talk and for her, her important work. Thanks. Thank you so much, Professor Daly and Professor Sundstrom, for those wonderful remarks. Um, we now have time for some questions and comments. Uh, we have some handheld microphones. Um, I ask uh, if you could please keep your questions and comments brief and to the point. Also, uh, if you could identify yourself and stand up, that would also be great. A uh, question right in the front here, please. And if, once, if you could just put your hand up and the, the students with the microphones can see you and then migrate to if you have a question and also, please. My name is Michelle Ehlers. I'm a global educator. I grew up in Africa. I've lived in China and in Europe. Um, thank you so much for bringing us back to the global perspective and integrating it with a local perspective. Um, and my question has to do with that as a global educator and somebody who's been working in transformational global leadership, how do we actually generate leadership that has the capacity to generate fulfillment of a seemingly impossible vision, such as eradicating climate change or dealing with climate change, um, for every human being? One of the things that I've seen is that one of the difficulties is to bring um, an awareness of what's happening globally, even if we wish to think globally and act locally, to actually become aware of what's happening, say, in China, if we're in the United States, um, particularly if we're not learning other languages or getting communication or getting news or news that's actually accurate. Um, and you touched on that a little bit. In China, when I was there, people are actually learning English, but we're not learning Chinese here we're not getting enough coverage. Um, I'm wondering how you might look at addressing that from a transformational perspective or what we might do to reach out to become aware of the rest of the world or how you see that fitting in with what we need to do here. Thank you. I would love to hear Bill's suggestions on this too. You've raised a really, really key question. And um, is the mic working? Um, <clears throat> one inspiration I find is in um, how the Nature Conservancy, and I know many cities and other kind of civic organizations are partnered with 
a matching entity in another country and actually put quite a lot into um, getting to know that other entity. Uh, even among the ranchers in Hawaii, the people featured the, the man there in one of those slides early on. It was head of the Hawaii Cattlemen's Association. And <clears throat> they would travel around the world to see how people ranched in other countries and um, go on these exchanges. And I think in, in the absence of personal exchange, it, it is really hard to get a meaningful sense of what life is like elsewhere and how we're all connected and how in, a, in many ways we face kind of the same problems everywhere. <clears throat> they have different colors to them and stuff in different places, but at, at their root, it's often the same kind of problem at play. Um, <clears throat> I also know there's a lot of change underway in academic institutions to try and um, give students the opportunity to learn the leadership skills and get the experience they're talking about. And I, I think Stanford's a little behind in this in some ways, and we, we're struggling now to pull a new master's program together that hasn't been announced, so don't consider this a formal announcement, but um, that would involve um, just a very different approach uh, to cultivating the awareness you're talking about uh, and the interdisciplinary sense, and then also some real experience. So people are bringing something of of clear and maybe a deeper value than um, just having been exposed to a lot of ideas. So that's in the works now and a lot of uh, people are investing in it. And I know across, uh, I was just in Europe for two years and there, there are many new kinds of institutes popping up there that are um, designed to address what you're bringing up. But I, I think we need a lot more. Bill, do you wanna respond? Um, I have little to add to that. I, I, I will just remark uh, that uh, Michelle Marvier, before, before we came on stage, was, was mentioning some, some reading she's been doing in conservation psychology. And I, I do think um, you know, one, one problem we have is, is just sort of getting the message across to people who are either apathetic or perhaps even hostile uh, in a way that um, appeals to them and, and, and reaches them. And I, I, you know, I, I think the sort of multi-faith dialogue is clearly an, an important component of this for, for, for people who are active in their religious denominations. Um, but then just figuring out how to, how to talk to people in a, in a way that, that is not confrontational and threatening, um, yet gets the, the meat of the, the predicament uh, across to them, I think is, is just a, a very, difficult challenge, but one that, that's clearly an important priority. Excellent. Yes, JC. Hi, um, I'm Julia Claire JC, and I'm a campus minister here at Santa Clara. Uh, one of the questions that kind of I was left with from the previous panel was around technology. There's clearly this critique of technology in the encyclical, and the mayor was kind of pushing back against that, and what was I was left with was this question of what, how do we discern around technology, and I, then I found both of you kind of speaking about discernment. So I guess I want to return to that and ask you, I can't imagine that you do the work that you do um, without really relying on this innovative technology we have at our fingertips, and I'm wondering how you discern in the work that you're doing with communities um, what the limits and like kind of advantages and disadvantages of technology are in the work you're doing in these ecosystems. Thanks, that's a really good question. As I read the encyclical, I saw you know, a number of places where one could <clears throat> take offense, say, or object, but that didn't bother me at all. I, I, I felt that the points being made were more directed toward <clears throat> the ways in which um, we deny the severity of the problem by saying, oh, well, <clears throat> human beings are so creative, we'll, we'll work our way out of it, or the way we become captives of technology like my poor son and his iPhone and things like that. Um, but I feel <clears throat> that technology is clearly with us and always will be, whether it's a stone tool or <laughs> something we haven't even dreamed of yet. And I, I'm excited by that and find that um, in all of the work, we're able to do so much more today than we were 10 years ago thanks to technology. And if we could you know, drive our creativity and 
passions toward goals that will achieve the grand vision laid out in the encyclical, then, then we're on the right path. There, there are so many ways in which technology, and I'd have to say including GMOs, you know, we can abuse the way we develop our agricultural enterprise, and uh, there are lots of abuses in it now. Um, <clears throat> or we can drive toward critical outcomes that would um, be much more achievable, you know, with the very best technology about behind us than if, as he says, you know, we don't want to go back to the Stone Age. So, so I feel all of that is possible, and it, it comes down to this is where you know comes down to issues of morality and uh, exercising democracy and engaging and defining goals that will achieve um, the the potential humanity has for peace and for justice and for harmony with um, all the other living creatures with whom we're so intimately connected. Bill? Well, I, you know, I think the, the, the encyclical is quite correct that technology is, is a set of tools and uh, some, in economics we sometimes think of it as a set of blueprints. It's, it's, it's knowledge that we we can ap apply, and, and the development process of technology is something that is not in, in one direction, but is, is steerable, uh, both through deliberate, perhaps democratic processes, as well as uh, through the provision of appropriate incentives. So I think what we want to do is take command to the extent possible over the direction of technology and, and, and direct it uh, as best we can to, to, solve, to help solve these problems. It's going to take a it's the human component first and foremost, making the right decisions and uh, taking the, the right measures. Uh, but but there's no question in my mind that that technology uh, development is going to be a, a, a huge assistance uh, in that process. Please. Um, hi, uh, my name is Calista Sini, and uh, my question is for um, Professor Sundstrom. Um, I loved how your one slide basically showed that a lot of the footprint, how long our human action footprint lasts if we're finally able with a NASA satellite to see something happening in Russia. And uh, as I watched um, Professor Daly's, uh, you know, um, presentation of ways of, of trying to measure our impact and on human uh, health and uh, well-being and on nature as well. I wondered within the discipline of economics, what, how, in that whole model of economics, which I have never studied, <laughs> I have to admit, uh, how, how do you value or um, weave into economic policies and theories um, the human component and the nature component? Is there something that um, already exists, or is it people on the outside, or on, not on the outside, but these interdisciplinary efforts that really drive it? Because we talk about the, mar I heard the market and the economy talked about as a, almost an, uh, a, a given, a entity in, in and of itself. So if you could help me understand how it reaches out, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Well, that's that is one of those twelve-hour <laughs> answers. Um, you know, I, I'll say a, a word or two about the market. I mean, we 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 talk about the market as some very abstract uh, institution, uh, and in our classes, we we teach people a, a set of sort of simplified technical tools to talk about how markets behave and prices are determined, etc. But markets are indeed human institutions. They evolve. They have many different properties in different markets. And uh, they're, they're also very contingent on, you know, to, to put it in a very uh, economistic way, the sets of property rights that define things. And, and one of the big problems, which is identified quite clearly in the encyclical, uh, with using the market to make decisions in uh, the world we live in, where we have these kinds of common, the, the global commons, shall we say, uh, is, is that no one owns that. So no one is going to be bothered to, to try to sell uh, the services of the ecosystem or the, or the climate system. And as a consequence, uh, no one ever pays the cost for uh, befouling them. So I, I think the way 
economists, their, the first sort of take on all these questions is to think about, um, you know, where is the market failing? And when the market is failing because certain uh, assets or values are not receiving the same treatment in the market as, as privately held assets, uh, is there a way to take advantage of the market in determining policies to, to alleviate those things? And I will say in terms of the, the sort of the human um, dimension of it, uh, I, that, that's a that's a big question, and I think economics can can rightly be accused of of maybe not paying sufficient attention to a number of the the aspects of sort of human life. But but um, you know we we, we want to take at least a very pluralistic and broad view of human values, and and once we do that, I think and respect people's various objectives and values, we, we start to have a way to think about how those those economic decisions interact with with those values, either to, to the, the positive or the negative. That's a rather vague response, but, uh, but these are certainly uh, rich and active concerns within the discipline, and, and um, so we're, we're working on it. Um. I was wondering if I might extend that question and pose a question to Professor Daly. How have you found among economists the reception to your work? Has it been broadly welcomed? Have you faced real resistance to it? Could you please comment on that? Well, for those of you who were here this morning and heard Professor Ramanathan, I can go back to some things he said about some of these early academies. Remember he was talking about the one in Rome and, and then about how key it's been to get Nobel laureates in, um, at the Papal Academy for their influence. So I just spent two years in Stockholm at the Swedish, you know, the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences that gives out the Nobel Prize. And um, about 20 years ago, they started convening Nobel economists in order to reform at least part of economics and create, you know, an environmental or ecological or you know, economics of kind of a sustainable um, future. And they had no trouble because they'd given out these Nobel Prizes. And, and so these wonderful people just flew in at the drop of a hat. <laughs> And, um, and then they'd bring ecologists together with them. And I was really lucky early on, I happened to be the student of one of the ecologists that got invited. And so I got invited in his shadow a little, but I got to watch then over this period of 20 or more years, the emergence of these new approaches. And um, so there are all these rifts in economics like there are among many academics, but without worrying about those, I'd say, there's a lot of agreement on how to um, approach valuing nature at some levels. When it comes to um, the things I was describing, like the catastrophe that can result from um, clearing forest and then opening a lot of flood risk, what people will do in that kind of a case, you know, you're looking at the forest as a type of asset, a stock of capital that provides a suite of benefits, one of which is flood control by soaking up and holding water in heavy rain periods. And you could ask, as China was able to do with a tragic real experiment, you know, what would the consequences be of eliminating that forest? And it was about $35 billion. Swiss Ray was the reinsurance firm, and the Chinese Academy of Sciences were all involved in this after the 1998 flooding that was attributed mostly to deforestation. So that, everybody would say, is a, this is where the controversy comes in. That's a lower bound estimate. That's not adding up all the lives that were lost and things. That's looking mainly at property damage. But um, when it comes to bringing the values of nature into decisions, often even a lower bound estimate like that one, or the, in the New York case, you're looking at um, what would it cost if you don't have that lovely Catskills ecosystem working well to purify water for New Yorkers. Um, what would it cost to substitute for that with technology, with a treatment plant that he's so excited about? That's, <laughs> those things are pretty expensive. That's partly why they're exciting. They're fancy. <laughs> and uh, that was six to eight billion dollars. So often even these sorts of estimates, nobody's saying that, um, that those are the full value of the nature in those 
places, but that's just one little tiny value of holding back floods or purifying drinking water. And even bringing in those little tiny dimensions of value can be enough to make clear the decision that you'd want to make for the long term. Um, so in Hawaii, too, they brought in all these identity issues and, and values of community and stuff that they, they never put a dollar metric on those, but, but they held them out there in the decision and then looked at you know what it would cost to approach one scenario versus another and uh, you know what the trade-offs would be with scarce resources. So overall, there's been a ton of progress made. And even though all this is in its infancy, nature used to be infinite. And people would just say it was either priceless or worthless. And um, now we can be a lot more nuanced and um, refined in the way we characterize values of nature and different types of decisions. Professor Daly, if I might just ask a final question. I think I may be articulating a collective consciousness here in posing this, but um, if you were being sent to colonize Mars, <laughs> what, what creatures would you bring? Well, I saw that movie, and I guess I'd bring potatoes. <laughs> it looked like... <laughs> but, you know, just to give myself a challenge and have some fun, I'd, I'd maybe bring a dolphin and a tiger and and see what we could make on Mars to support <laughs> some real charisma up there. <laughs> Thank you very, very much. Well, please join me in thanking Professor Daly and Professor Sunstrom. <laughs>